Welcome everyone and thank you all for coming. My name is Kyle LaBelle and you may refer to me using they them pronouns. I am the CEO of the Winnipeg South Center Federal Green Party Association and I will be your host and moderator for this afternoon. This event is the first in this, in a possible series designed to engage Greens and prospective Greens and to increase green policy literacy. We are grateful you have chosen to be here today and we look forward to spending the next 90 minutes with you. To begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. This acknowledgement holds significance for me personally because it is the first time that I have offered one publicly. In preparing for today, it was important for me to understand at least some of the history and meaning of the words I'm about to offer. From what I gather, one of the functions of a land acknowledgement is to participate in the counter erasure of Indigenous peoples and to remind settlers of the part we play in the ongoing harms of colonization. With that in mind, I offer the following. Treaty 1 and parts of Treaties 2 through 5 make up the province of Manitoba. I join you now from Treaty 1 land, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. Talk of land is particularly relevant today, given the topic of our webinar. Agriculture and food have often been manipulated to harm Indigenous peoples, and whole ecosystems have been destroyed to make way for agricultural operations. It is also true that significant disparities exist between the North and South of the country. I do not know what agriculture and food policy made in the spirit of reconciliation looks like, but I invite us all to keep this in mind as we move forward. As one part of my personal work towards reconciliation, I commit to continuing to learn about Indigenous history and about the ongoing impacts of colonization. Thank you. A couple notes on moderation before I introduce our speaker. Uh, we invite folks to engage with the content of the presentation and with each other using the chat. Um, we also invite you to interact using the reaction feature at the bottom of the your screen. Uh, in that same spot, you can also thank you. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Uh, so we welcome people to voice questions. So you can raise your hand to ask, uh, and we'll call on you to speak and and ask a question. Um, if you prefer, you can also put questions in the chat, uh, and I will be monitoring that and sharing them with the group um, at appropriate moments. Some rules of engagement. Uh, we ask that you be mindful of how you are showing up in this space. If you tend to take up a lot of room, consider practicing slowing down and leaving space for others. And if you tend to be more shy, we invite you to practice speaking up and sharing your thoughts. When multiple people wish to speak, priority will be given to those that have not spoken as much. And finally, just dis disruptive and disrespectful behavior will not be permitted, and we reserve the right to remove anyone found to be disruptive or otherwise disrespectful. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Maria Rodriguez grew up in Venezuela and emigrated to Canada 29 years ago. She has a lifetime of experience in both national and international agriculture production systems, research, and policy. Maria recently retired from the Federal Public Service, where she held a variety of responsibilities, most recently with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada as Manager of Science, Policy, and Partnerships. She holds an Agriculture Engineering degree from the Central University of Venezuela and a PhD in Animal Science from McGill University in Montreal. Excuse me. <coughs> in Montreal. She lives in Montague, PEI. Maria is the Shadow Cabinet Critic of Agriculture and Food Security for the Green Party of Canada. Shadow Cabinet Critics play a vital role in promoting green policies and priorities and serving as spokespeople for the party. Maria, thank you for joining us today, and I pass the floor over to you. And thank you so much, um, Kyle, for the introduction. And uh, one thing that I would like to say is that you are not going to be the only one ask, asking questions. So he was explaining what to do when uh, our um, a participant asks a question. But uh, also, I like to explain what to do when I ask a question, uh, which is going to happen uh, several times uh, because it's, it's meant to be interactive and we want your input. So I guess uh, we're going to be using the order of the raised hands in Zoom as we usually do. Um, are you okay with that, Kyle, and monitoring that? 
Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, because if we had the meeting set up, uh, then you can just go in a circle and ask everybody. But um, and and this particular format, uh, that's not possible. Oh, Liz, is Liz asking a question? No. Okay, I saw I saw this on my screen. All right, so thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen and by apologizing in advance for any internet mishaps. And that uh, today we are going to uh, talk about policy and uh, why are we talking about policy? Let me just share this and if there, let's see. Uh, please let me know if you can see, if everybody can see this properly. Yes, I see a positive um, feedback. So we're going to talk a little bit about agriculture and food security, which is a, an area of policy where the, the Greens have a number of policies, positions, and platform uh, statements. And um, we're gonna be giving some highlights, but also because this is the first time that this uh, potential series of, um, of seminars, uh, uh, it's offered. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit, and the, one, one of the purpose of this activity is to uh, increase uh, policy liter literacy at that, that, that's what, um, Kyle, can you remind me about the policy literacy part? Uh, uh, so, okay, sorry about that. So the idea is that I'm gonna, gonna speak a little bit about policy in general and policy in the Green Party of Canada and, uh, and how it's governed. Then um, we're gonna talk about the different places where you can find GC, uh, uh, Green Party policy and, wh and where to find it and how they fit in all this framework uh, for the party and for policy. And then we are just gonna give a few highlights of our policy and position on different issues. And uh, we'll talk about later why this is called highlights. Some of the ongoing controversies and some of the emerging issues uh, that are coming up and should be on our radar. And then we'll, we'll have hopefully lots of time for discussion. All right, so um, moving to the next one. Okay, so the first part, uh, we're gonna speak about policy and the Green Party of Canada. It's an introduction. And this is about, okay, let's, let's, start, let's start at the beginning. I would like, if you are here and you are attending this, this session, it's because you are interested in policy. Uh, so why? Why does it matter to you? And why do you think that policy matters? And I am looking for some comments on the chat or raised hands. I'm, Kyle is going to be taking care of this because I cannot see. So why does police matter to you, matter in general and what does it matter to you? So Matthew says that it can guide government investments. Janine has raised her hand. Then we give the my can you open the mic for Janine? Thank you. Um, I use policy as a way to introduce um, concerned citizens to what our program, what programs we want to put in place as Green Party members, so that they understand how they can match their values with our actions and change our systems to be more resilient. So thank you so much, Janine, for that. And I'm seeing that Andrew is saying that he wants to know uh, what the Green Party policy positions are on important issues. We're gonna do a little bit of that today, but 
as you're gonna see, you're gonna have homework too because there's just too much, too much for uh, you. You're gonna have to just go and find out because there's too many policies. But anyway, that's that's part of what we're doing. So anybody else would like to comment? Okay, so let's let's move forward a little bit because uh, the I saw something else on the chat. Policy one the party stuff for aha. So he already oops. I already um it's going. I got too excited and started clicking uh, buttons and this was, this happened. So the last person who put this on the chat, uh, it actually already answers my, uh, already gave my answer. Uh, all the other ones are also important. It is our purpose. It's what we stand for. And if we go to the constitution of the Green Party of Canada, article four, the first thing it's going to say about what we're trying to do as a party uh, is to advance platform positions, policy, values, and basis of unity. All of those things are related to our policy, which is what we stand for um, as, um, as um, oh, there's more coming. Yes, many other things are coming that we're going to talk about all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for uh, uh, being so active participants. I like that. So, um, so this is what we're trying to do. A political party six political power in order to advance an agenda. And that's, that's how we differentiate ourselves. And that's our policy. So, um, all right. So, And what do what we understand as policy is is a collection of things, and uh, different different units of the party or different um, uh, I guess different instances are responsible for different things, uh, and this is all. Uh, enshrined in our constitution. Uh, if you read the Green Party constitution, you're going to see that all our policies are supposed to be consistent with a series of values. And these values are common to all the Green Parties because they are part, they are in this, uh, uh, part in the of the charter of the global Greens. And, and all we all know what those values are, right? Ecological wisdom. Uh, oops. Oh, my really bad at this. Okay. Uh, participatory democracy, non-violence, uh, sustainability, respect for diversity. So policy in the strict sense as defined in the constitution, it's a motion that if adopted in a vote open to all members, articulate what the party would work toward is if like that. In the Green Party, the membership sets policy. We are responsible, each of us, to set, pol setting, to set policy. And we do that through motions that are uh, submitted uh, individually or collectively. Uh, and the way it, the process works now, the motions are submitted at our general meetings. But there is a committee of the party that is working toward implement to developing and implementing a process that will be more continuous. So there would be intake of policy proposals all the time. And the, the this committee, which is the policy development and process committee, and also the shadow cabinet, we all work in trying to improve this process. Um, so the membership is responsible for policy, but the, but we have specific spokespersons that are responsible for positions and platforms. And these spokesperson are the leader, and now we have a co-leader, deputy leader, parliamentary caucus, and the shadow cabinet. And uh, what is a position? A position is a public statement that articulates where the party stands on 
particular issues uh, and what should be done about it. And this can take many forms. A position can be a, a, pub, a, a media release. It could be, uh, I guess, a, a, a speech as part of the debate in cabinet, sorry, pardon, in parliament, because we are not in cabinet yet, only the shadow cabinet. It could, it could take many, it could be a response to a consultation. It could take many forms and we'll talk about that later too. And then there's the platform, which is specific for a given election. And it's just a collection of positions. Uh, and for each election, the party decides, these are what the things we're gonna uh, focus on for the platform. And then the platform is written with a position of, uh, a collection of positions. And all of these positions have to be consistent uh, and not contradict uh, member, the member approved policies. And sometimes um, there, isn't there isn't a policy. So uh, the, the spokespersons do have to take a position on something and we don't have a written policy. And in this case, uh, our guide, our guidance comes from the green values. So, um, so that's, I, I'm talking about all of these because this is the first, the first uh, instance of this series. And I think it's important to understand the, the landscape or, or the framework uh, and what, how policy works in the Green Party. And now we're gonna talk about our policies and where to find them. And Today, we're going to also be talking about some specific policies and positions on different things, but it's important to know where to find them because there are so many uh, that we won't have time to discuss today. So it's good to locate those things. So the green values uh, are based on the principles of the Global Green Charter, and both of them can be found in the, in the Constitution. Um, then, do you, do you want me to look at them, or maybe we? I guess you can do this yourself because everybody more or less knows what the green values are. And but it's all. I, I recommend that you have a, a look at the Global Green Charter, which is an appendix in the Constitution, because it, it expands a little bit more on the explanation of these green values and it's, it's, it's helpful. And then this is the easy part, just you know, uh, all of these documents, uh, the links are there. And I think um, Kyle is sharing them as I speak. The, yeah, Kyle is sharing them as I speak. And then we have this next thing is the member approved policies. And this is where things get a little bit complicated because um, we have years and years of a variety of policies that have been passed by members in multiple conventions. And this is a little bit challenging, challenging because some of them have become outdated with time and there hasn't been a process to retire them or repeal the ones so they don't contradict the new ones, but still, this is officially our policy, it's called the Green Book. And I'm just gonna open it and we are gonna have a look at it. Maria, and then, mm -hmm. I just wanted to let the audience know and let you know too that this Green Book, when I tried accessing it earlier, like you have to be logged in to your member account on the website. So this isn't publicly available, well, um, it's available to members. It's available to members only, yes. <laughs> And, and, and you're gonna see this green book and when you open that link, you're going to see the different conventions, but the actual policies are in this attachment, which is, um, which is a PDF file. And if you open that attachment, uh, you are going to see that the reason we're not gonna talk about every single one of them today it's because there's a long list of things, some of them very specific, and but we are going to talk about some of some of the general positions the party has taken on 
on uh, each of these areas. Um, okay, so I'm just scrolling just to just I, I'm, I'm make, give myself an excuse for not speaking about each of those things today. And you can see why, right? Okay. So now let's go back to here. Then we have positions. And I was saying earlier that positions have take, they come in many shapes or forms. Uh, if you want to say what our MPs are saying in parliament, what they are saying during debates, during committee hearings, all of that it can be found in the um, um, parliament, the, the House of Common website. And this is, uh, looks very um, intimidating, but the way you find something is by doing, uh, I guess, keyword searches, because uh, otherwise you will never find things in there. It has so many. So let's say I'm going to uh, say Elizabeth May Agriculture. You see what Elizabeth ever said in agriculture? Maybe this is too ambitious uh, considering my, yeah. So we have 2,730 hits and some of them are bills, uh, in, intervention in bill debates. Some of them are um, committee hearings and all kinds of stuff. So that's, that's how that website works. It's very useful if you have more specific because now I just enter very general term, uh, then, uh, then uh, you will find things. It's not hard. I did again. Sorry. I just I'm trying to look at the chat and then uh, it hit the wrong button repeated times. So uh, then there's media releases and public. Yeah, I don't tell me that this is this moves too quick and some things go too slow. So. All these links here uh, uh, are links to the different places where we found positions, media releases, public statements, social media, uh, and uh, Cal is sharing them all. And you will also have access to this presentation at the end. There is a document that is very useful. It's called Vision Green. And the last time it was updated, it was in 2019 or 20. It says 2020 on the on the website, but I understand it was 2019. And this is, it, it's like a consolidation or a document that integrates uh, a lot of the different green policies and positions in something, I guess, understandable. And for, it's a, it's a way to explain our policy positions uh, to people and to ourselves. And it, it doesn't have absolutely every position that we have taken in everything, but it's a good summary of important things. And then there is a link here for the platform for the 2021 election. And I put it there because it's the latest platform, but we must not forget that platform become obsolete the moment the election happens because there's gonna be a new one for the next election. So I was the platform for the 2021 specifically, but still has some, it, I guess 99% of what is there, it's are key areas of our agriculture and food policy that are not going to change. So it, it's also a useful uh, resource. Um, okay, so, any questions about BPC policy and where to find it? Or should we move to the highlights? Uh, 
I'm trying to see in the chat. Let me kiss on A. I'm not seeing any hand raised, no comments in the chat just yet. Um, but... Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to give you some more excuses why a lot of things that, that probably very important are not gonna appear today, uh, which is it's, agriculture policy is massive. Uh, agriculture is multifunctional. And what that means is that it has many roles and it influences many things aside from producing food, fuel, and fabric. And that's a, that's a, a term that is it's used in international um, trade, international development, and in, um, I guess, negotiations of all kinds where people argue over what subsidies have or not to have. And, and what that means is that, that it's, it, go, it touches on practically everything. And then agriculture policy also touches on practically everything. So um, I, when we think of ag agriculture as producing food, fuel, and fabric, that's the more direct things. But then of course, if it's the largest, it's the, largest single human activity in terms of use of land. And it, it by using this land, at, we, it, it has a huge impact on resources and it has displaced indigenous people. It had, a, I guess, a contribute to degradation of water, soil, biodiversity. It contributes to climate change. It can be, it, it, of, these are the negatives of, and of course, depending on the policies you have, then you can have a positive effect or a, or a restoration effect on those things. So this it, agriculture policy is very important in that sense because it's just covering a resource that is practically the biggest human intervention on earth. Uh, landscape preservation, rural community survival, employment, food security, social justice, health, culture, and heritage. And if I keep thinking about it, I'll come up with more things. Uh, but that's because I'm biased toward this particular uh, agriculture. I find it very exciting. I'm, I'm passionate about it all my life. So in terms of our policy, we have more than 30 individual member approved policies directly targeting agriculture, something that you would call agriculture policy or food systems policy. But many more, but if you look at all these documents that I was showing you, the, uh, I guess the, the green book, vision green, the platform, they are, they are the, divide up in different areas or domains, which uh, have some degree of consistency with the federal portfolios and the ministers uh, of cabinet, et cetera, okay? And these domains, in almost all of them, or in many of them, we have also agriculture policy, although we don't call it agriculture policy, but it's there because it has to do with agriculture and food, and food is everywhere and agriculture is all over the place. So here are some examples. Uh, environment, climate, we have environment and climate change uh, ministers uh, in Canada, health, indigenous sovereignty, labor, rural development, and justice. Can somebody give me an example of an, a, a policy on justice that has to do with agriculture? Um, trying to see. Lindsay in the chat says high food prices. Uh, thank you for, Le Lindsay, thank you for that. Uh, indigenous should be capitalized. You're right. Uh, yes. So justice. Um, 
Shell has also added no hormones into dairy products. No hormones into dairy products. It is, well, that is true, but it that would not normally be in the justice portfolio in terms of the federal portfolio distribution. Migrant labor, that's one, yeah. Yeah, that's justice, that uh, it would be a policy that you may not find that you would you will find reference to it uh, in the in the justice portfolio, and it is agriculture policy. Uh, indigenous sovereignty, of course, land I guess uh, land claims and uh, resource development, all of those things of often have implications that have to do with agriculture and food, uh, rural development, things like. Uh, uh, the, uh, supporting small communities or small businesses in communities or rural internet often have uh, uh, implications or connections with agriculture. Uh, the right to clean water, that's a good one as well. It's environment, right, and climate, everything. So agriculture touches in a lot of areas. So we have more than 30 individual member approved policies directly under that subtitle. And then you have to look into all the other subtitles and you'll define a bunch more. Okay, so now we come to the part that I guess that we all want to discuss here because to see what, again, policies, what we stand for and where do we stand on, on, on some of these issues. But this is, these are highlights. Uh, this is included, but not limited to, uh, because it's it's not possible in a in 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 a um, um, session this short to go all, all over all of the agriculture policy and food policy uh, that the Green Party has um, developed. So, but these are just some areas, I guess. Hi, these are some areas uh, that high level that the Greens support uh, that you can find in different places in all our policies in or many of our policies positions and platform. Organic transition, we have specific policies that's, that um, advocate for uh, our farming systems to, uh, uh, I guess, to transition to organic. And same thing with regenerative practices. There, we have those ter specific terms in our policy. And of course, the things that have to do with soil conservation also related to those two things. Then we have uh, policies and position on in uh, increased biodiversity of uh, our farming system. And this include Agrobiodiversity, which is things like varieties, intercropping, polyculture, whatever, uh, heritage varieties, uh, agrobiodiversity, but also biodiversity of other organisms like pollinators or soil microbiology and things like that. So it's the crops, the animals, and also all the uh, ecosystem that sustains our production. So that's there's multiple uh, green policies that deal with this aspect. Um, we have policies specific on research uh, that um, advocate for a shift to research programs and regulatory approach, approaches that support these transitions or these kinds of system as opposed to some of the system that we have been supporting, which it leads us to our next uh, slide, because we also have policies on things that we don't want anymore or we want to move away from. For example, we have policies on phasing out synthetic chemicals and pesticides, antimicrobials for growth promotion in livestock. Um, we have, uh, this is very important. I, and it's, and it's not, I find that it's in too many different places and we should have a big, big policy dealing with that second item, which is the kind of system that we are putting our money on. Because 
for decades in Canada and in, in, in many other countries, we have had policies that they end up promoting or favoring or tipping the scale in favor of these intensive monoculture-based cropping system, which are dependent on lots of agrochemicals. They often corporate control uh, by multinationals and that those systems where we have been putting uh, taxpayer money on them and it helps them, it's not just the market. And same thing with large scale intensive lives of operations. So this, this uh, policy about the kind of things we want to move away from is important. And it's, it's, it, it is the, I guess the, um, the other side of the coin of this one, right? We want to support the things, increase the support for certain things so we can give them a chance to tra transition to things that are more sustainable and more green and greener, I should say. And then we want to move away from other things. And this is the same with research. Federal research, we oppose as a party, federal research support for a, a high input agriculture, large scale ag agribusiness, et cetera. And uh, I guess uh, there's many different policies that have to do with this. Uh, that if you read all those policy documents, you will easily find them and I won't go over each, of, each one of them. And so we talked about the things we want to support the things that we want to move away from as greens. And there are areas that we're not saying we want to eliminate them from the face of the earth, but we want to increase our oversight. And uh, one of them crop derived, crops uh, derived from biotechnology. A lot of people say that the greens are against biotech, but what greens are against is about biotech that doesn't have the right oversight. Uh, because we support the precautionary principle. That, can anybody uh, comment on what the precautionary principle is? I'm hearing, I'm looking for um, answers to my question. Yes, so Janine says, safety must be proven. Essentially, if there's not enough evidence or something, and just because there's no ev evidence of something being bad, doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it's good, right? If there's uncertainty in science and you just need a body of evidence and often, and the, the other aspect of the precautionary principle is do no harm. Uh, if you are not sure, that you are going to release something into the environment and I guess wreak havoc with biodiversity and weeds and whatnot, it shouldn't be released. And that's been the position of the, of the Green Party. And that is not the, the way the government assesses biotech because we don't apply the precautionary principle to everything. So, and the other thing is labeling. Uh, labeling of uh, the green support, labeling of genetically engineered foods, which currently we do not require in Canada. Uh, we want to strengthen oversight in drugs in animal production. The Greens don't say that you cannot give an antibiotic to an animal, but we do say that there shouldn't uh, be, the, I guess there should be the right checks and balances and, and the right oversight of their use. Uh, pesticide residues, uh, the green support, uh, there is data, open data monitoring of pesticide residues in foods which uh, right now in theory we have. You can go to the government open data and have and find some residue surveys there, but they're limited. And sometimes you find what you're looking for and sometimes you don't. And that, that um, I uh, suggest that you try it one day because it's interesting. It's interesting, not so much what you do find, but what you don't. So it, that needs to improve. Uh, then we, of course, are green party, so we have to have always things in terms of climate, climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. 
climate related policies and then with green, green support policies to um, sequester or uh, capture carbon in the soil through incentives to increase organic matter. And these are relatively recent policies uh, that we have passed. Uh, we support greenhouse gas emission targets for all the components of the agri-food system from the soil, the, na the nitrogen fertilization, livestock emissions, farm machinery, the tra transportations, processing, all the components. We support, of course, reducing fossil fuels in agriculture. And one big chunk of that is emissions from uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which is indirect because it's happened when you, uh, during synthesis of, of, of nitrogen fertilizer, it's very, very, um, it consumes a large amount of, of um, fossil fuels. And recently there was a consultation and we sent um, a response from the Green Party, a government consultation because the government is working on a strategy to reduce emissions from nitrogen fertilizers. And the only target that they were, that they were um, including was the, um, I guess the nitrogen oxide uh, emissions from the fertilizer once it's on the ground, you put nitrogen and then some is lost in the air. And they were not taking into account the fossil fuels that are used when it's synthesized. Uh, but the Greens think that should have, we should have targets for that. And the and another one that is also important is the is um, restructuring Canada business risk management program to help farmers cope with climate risk. And uh, as you know, uh, the uh, I guess one uh, important and pretty significant uh, form of support mechanism or instrument of policy instrument of support uh, for agriculture that uh, Canada has is this business management programs that includes things like, um, I guess, income stability policies like agri-stability, they have agri-recovery, there's something went wrong, uh, credit, et cetera. And then they are not, they need to be reviewed because when those programs were designed, they, I guess, the the climate risk was kind of a second thought. It was always there because agriculture has always been very vulnerable to environmental risk and to climate. But now this has become the, uh, I guess, the main thing every year there's something and the business, it's a business risk and programs should be designed to cope with that. I see that the chat and the Q's and A's are flying up and I'm not, uh, okay, so Kyle, I don't know that, Sarah, that's intriguing. Sarah, Sarah, you're saying it's our most developed, Sarah is saying that this is our most developed section. Is that right? I didn't know that myself. Huh. I guess like that just means like that's the area we have the most like member developed policies relating to, is that what that means? Well, we have lots, but it's because of what mm. we were saying earlier, right? That agriculture is is everywhere. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Shell is saying, uh, standing on purpose, engage folks and increase policy liter literacy, great initiative. And I did not know about it. Maybe I did not read the whole email. Yes, so those are those are the those th that was the purpose because we're talking about the party's policies, but also we try to engage people. Um, yeah, I don't know, Shell. Do you do you want to suggest something can that we're not doing and we can do more? This is I don't know if you were there at the beginning, Shell, but we were saying that this is the first. We, we, the, the, the idea is that this was going to be the first of a series, and we're hoping that you guys who are the guinea pigs are help us improving it. Uh, Shell has raised her hand. 
and build on it. Oh yeah, yeah. You say the used me thing. That's the same thing I said. But the 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 webinar, <laughs> the webinar had already been created. I, I also know. prefer meeting. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm speaking. I can, can hear you. Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. I can't see me, so I presume that's a function of of the webinar how you've got it up. Uh, unfortunately. Um, not worth explaining why I couldn't be here for like the first six or seven minutes. Uh, so I missed the intro. And my comment re regarding sort of the confusion was I may maybe I didn't read the whole invitation as to what 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 this uh, event is about. And it's I think it's a very interesting uh, initiative in this particular one. And uh, it, it would be great if more people knew about it and i don't know maybe more people do know about it and i just didn't read the email it's i feel i'm feeling i'm feeling really alienated and weirded out speaking into space and 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 not seeing who i'm talking to and not seeing myself um i don't understand why people use webinars um this is very uncomfortable and unpleasant and i love what you're doing maria as always <laughs> <laughs> thank you Cheryl. That's lovely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you are right about the webinars, and Kyle can attest that I uh, was the first thing I said too. But uh... <laughs> yeah, may I, may I respond to that quickly, Maria? Yeah, yeah. I know it's not it's your fault, so please do, please do. Yeah, like this is. Thank you, Shell. I appreciate all the feedback. Um, there's also going to be like a, a formal form at the end where people can provide feedback in that constructed way. Um, and yeah, this is the first time this has been organized. I organized the event from scratch and it was primarily promoted in Manitoba. So an email cool. invitation that included the um, the statement of purpose uh, was sent out to everyone that we could contact via email in Manitoba. And then it was shared a little bit more sparingly with other provinces. Um, so this is sort of like the pilot of the event. Um, and we already have decided that, yeah, if we did this again, we would organize it in, an, in a standard meeting format. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to change that setting after the without changing the Zoom link and we had already started promotion. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. I, I heard that last part. So it wasn't a fact of someone at headquarters or something blocking you and saying, no, it has to be a webinar if you're it's, it's just that you had already sent out promotion, even though Maria didn't want it to be a webinar, you sent out promotion for a webinar? Uh, just the way that Zoom is structured, like we had already created the Zoom link and meeting number and passcode, and without, where we weren't able to make it not a webinar without changing that information. Um, but it's, but it's, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it, but it sounds like you selected a webinar. I did. And then you created it. And, yeah. And even though you had already and maybe you hadn't had your discussions yet about whether it should be a, a webinar or a meeting exactly. maybe i should speak to this yeah. what, because the event is called seminar or webinar this all happened with the the creation of the meeting by the it people happened right. before right so I, before i say i like i I, I say it like meeting. So after the event was already created by the IT people of the Green Party of Canada, I and I have a call. Okay. I have a call okay. with Kyle to to strategize. And then at that moment, I say, "Oh, you know, and let's do it as a meeting." But that was already created. It was too late. Yeah, no, I got it. I think. Yeah, so and, it was nobody's and, and fault. You, and you had the link specifically asked for webinar or specifically asked for meeting. It's just right. that it was an afterthought. Oh, right. So, so the promotion of yeah. the event, the promotion of the event, including the link, went out before you realized you wanted to meet it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. On exactly. <laughs> That's you. what happened. But it was it was inexperience on our part. Uh, yeah. Both of us. But it won't happen again. <laughs> that's, okay. that's reassuring. <laughs> Let, let's uh, move back into the content too. I'm just noticing we have about half an hour left. Um, so I want to make sure we focus on agriculture. But yeah. And we have time for questions. Exactly. So uh, questions and discussions. So then where were us? Uh, Sarah uh, has a great question in the chat. Uh, pardon my interruption. Um, 
Sarah has asked Maria, do you see your various sources as being mutually supportive or disconnected? How do you manage the overlaps or possible contradictions, gaps filled by others, such as member made policy book, election platform docs, vision green? So, oh, good question. Uh, this is this all comes down with our history in terms of how our policy process has been has had its ups and downs. Let's put it this way: uh, there have been uh, multiple situations, attempts to change it. Uh, it I, I guess uh, the pendulum has swung. Uh, in the way the policy process works. And it has swung a few times. And that is the cause of the contradictions because if, if we were all working together like a whale oil ecosystem, uh, live ecosystem, I don't want to say machine because it is about agriculture. So uh, if we were all working together in our processes and in our governance structures, this would, no, we would not have this problem, but there is some, there is a little bit of that because I guess the policy process has had its ups and downs. And uh, there is a group of people who are trying to fix it. And Sarah is trying some things on her side and I'm trying to put some things on my side. And I think that we have to build on, we have to do this work it's a governance thing, and it will get better. I think, have I answered your question, Sarah? I think Sarah is also asking, like, in the meantime, how did you navigate all the, like, if there are contradictions, like, how did you navigate all that information to produce the document and the information you're sharing with us now? The document I'm sharing with you now, you, you now is, is highlights of areas that are pretty consistent across the, uh, the uh, you can safely say it. this is green policy. Well, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the contradictions later, very briefly. Uh, there are things that need to be addressed. There are contradictions, but there are certain things that are not. And the bulk of the green policy related to agriculture is fairly solid. Uh, is that, does that answer your question? Is yeah, just the, I ha, at a high level, these things are the, the things that were mentioned here, you can safely say they are green policy. And there are all things that are not like that. But because there's so many, we cannot talk about every single one today. But the documents are there. And if you have questions, um, always be yours because I can talk about this stuff for. Uh, I mean, anytime. Sarah says yes, this did answer her question. Yeah, thank you. So going back to the these policies, we have this carbon sequestration of farms to incentive to increase organic matter. And that is something that we have a policy and it could be improved because I think that policies should say something about inclusion and equity in the way these incentives uh, take place. And that in the platform, you can find the equity and inclusion thing and the actual member policy you can't. And it's one of these things that the main thing is good, but I think it could be improved. That's my personal. Then we want to have greenhouse emission tar targets for all the components of the system. Uh, again, from the beginning, reducing fossil fuel. Oh, we already talked about this and the business ring management. Why am I repeating this? Let's go to the next one. Um, yes, yeah, so they all, we were talking about uh, before, this is an area of policy, agriculture and climate. We, before that, we talk about agriculture that uh, follows ecological principles, which is an important value for green. And now we're going to talk about food security and for sovereignty. And of course, this, this kind of compartmentalizations or classifications are all artificial because everything, everything is related to everything, okay? But in terms of food security and food sovereignty, we had a number of policies on localization, uh, supporting local food system, local value chains, local infrastructure, regional self-sufficiency. We have policies on uh, seed 
uh, I guess, seed sovereignty or food sovereignty, the right of farmers to save their own seed. Seed banks, seed exchange, agrobiodiversity conservation, like to keep the diversity of our agricultural resource base because it's being lost. Uh, we have policy on publicly developed plant, cultivar plant cultivars and animal breeds that should remain in the public domain because there's too many pressures to privatize a lot of these. And um, we have, of course, policies on protection of farmland. And I cannot stress enough that this is extremely critical given that farm, uh, I guess, agriculture is, is such a big chunk of the, of the land that we use by humankind. And some of the farmland is going, uh, I guess, it's being lost. And at the same time, uh, there is destruction of other, uh, I guess, ecosystems to create farmland. So all the land protection policies to protect what already exists and to prevent, uh, I guess, destruction of ecosystems. This is all very, very important. We have policies on regulation to challenge corporate concentration, which is incredibly important to it's a green policy and it's very important because concentration is being happening in the system and we're losing like, farmers are getting bigger and farmers are getting fewer and the processing sector is concentrated, the, the food retail is, and this is not good for anybody other than for these big companies and uh, it, the Greens advocate for regulations to, to prevent that from happening. And it's been happening uh, for many years. Uh, we are against patenting, patenting of life forms, patent, uh, a patent for something that is alive and that a lot of the uh, intellectual property uh, around things like varieties or my, even even microbiological things, people are patenting microbes, microbes to add them to the soil. And these microbes are already in the soil. How can you patent that? So the greens are against all of that kind of stuff. And of course, there's something that people not normally uh, associate with food policy, but the gu guaranteed life of income, it's food policy because that will allow people to buy food. <laughs> A healthy food and, and eat well, right? So, and ensuring access to healthy food, that's also food policy. And that's something you would find guaranteed, like, guaranteed life of income on the social um, development policies and healthy food and the health policy. But all of these things are related to agriculture and food, of, uh, evidently. Um, yes. And uh, I know, uh -huh. yes. Uh huh. Sorry, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, if I can field those to you now. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna open them. Um, uh, Annie, okay, let me just see, I have. I'll go ahead and read them out loud if that's okay too. Yes, um, please. So we have one, I'll go for, for Matthew first and then to Shell. So for Matthew, we have, are there any explicit policy references to promoting urban agriculture or would that be contained within the localization of food systems policy? The answer is not or is and. Yes, there are explicit policy reference to promoting your urban agriculture, and they are contained with that within the localization, but there are specific policies for that in the policy book. You will find them uh, if you have if, if you have the courage to look for them. I'll see if I can pick <laughs> that up while we're sitting here too. Uh, and then Shell voiced a, a question about farmland being used to grow transportation fuel. Um, I don't know if Shell, you want to expand on that, um, but I, I guess maybe. Yeah, that's biofuels, you mean? Perhaps. Do we have policies about that? Well, I, we do have policies, uh, but uh, they're old, actually saying that biofuels are good but that's but if you use bio if you use land that could produce food, uh, fuels for food 
this is a little bit, it's something that is a little bit outdated because we do not have a policy, I don't think, that says do not grow fuel on farmland. But right now, I think the positions of the Green Party is that that shouldn't be done, or or we we don't we don't advocate for that kind of thing, growing few, uh, food for fuel on farmland. Like the, but I don't think we have specific policy in the Green Book that says that. If we do, I have missed it because we used to have an old one that was in favor of of. Uh, indirectly in favor of biofuels, but say, by saying that fuel, uh, fuels for transportation should not come from fossil fuels. And, and now there should be one, and there have been positions that are critical of industrial growing of grains for fuel. And this is very interesting. We're going to talk about animal agriculture in a minute in the controversy part, and that has related to that too. So if we want, we can talk about that later. But does that answer your question? Or yeah, so my, my, my comment had, had come up. Well, I, was, I was thinking about it when you were showing us a slide and, and talking about the, the, the different uh, impacts, uh, farming concerns. And that came to mind. I don't, I don't know whether it was U.S. Uh, USA's uh, statistics or something uh, to the effect that uh, a huge uh, a huge portion of the farmland was actually not growing food anymore for not food food for humans, but was uh, was producing uh, ethanol uh, for for fuel. Um, and I'm not quite sure where that relates to the statistics around. Uh, ranches around grazing lands and, and so much of the land that's for, farmland being taken up um, with, uh, with with the raising of beef and dairy. We're going to go talk about the, the biofuel thing in a minute. It's uh, because it it's part of something else that, uh, but I do not think we have a uh, policy. Sarah is it's, it's, it's suggesting that you go to the member forum are you suggesting that, Sarah? Did you see the link to the policy book that I put at the beginning? It's, there is a link in the, on this presentation that Kyle shared that it goes straight to the policy book. Uh, My and sense you can search and you can search in the policy book for every specific policy in every single detail that we're not touching on here. Uh, I don't know if Sarah put the link on, but I know Kyle did at the beginning. Okay. My general sense is that Maria, you know so much about this that if that if it doesn't immediately come to your mind, it's probably not there. Okay, but you see, we don't support biofuels now. Um, yeah, at and least not yet. But yeah, as as we, compared we, to as. as as compared to diesel and gas, it looks pretty good. But then when you realize what the impact of creating it is, that it's not coming from uh, re recycling something that already exists. If you're putting land into growing stuff, then it's not so sustainable. You see, but in my call for action in a little while, I'm gonna ask you guys that if you see something after you study all this document that we gave you links for, if you see something in the glaring that we should have been developing policy on and it's not there, that's the next step, right? That's the next step for engagement, which is one of the purpose of this, this activity. But okay, so let's go back to the list. The Greens do support, animal welfare, improving con conditions for, not just for farm animals, but the part that has to do with agriculture, animals in transport, slaughterhouses, living conditions for farm animals, et cetera, uh, that uh, we do support improving all those things. Um, I'm, I see Janine's hand is up. Is that from before? Or were you wanting to speak, Janine? Um, Thank you. I just didn't know how to take it down. I entered my comment uh, about the amount of calories that biofuels take in chemical agriculture into the um, into the chat because the estimates that I've seen verified is that it's as many as 17 calories spent in creating biofuels for every one calorie that is produced. So it's incredibly unsustainable. 
it's incredibly unsustainable. And, yeah, and thank you. I don't think any green person will support that today, but we may not have a specific member approved policy who says that says exactly that. So, uh, but again, there's policies, there's positions, there are platforms, and though all of those are game for you guys to look into them and propose different things. Because in our party, policy is set by the membership. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so so now let's talk about it. And all of these are all that. Let me just, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but all of these are highlights. There's more than this. Uh, and that's why uh, I guess if you are interested, uh, I encourage you to go and the policy book to go and the party position, all these different places where you can find the party positions, the previous platform, et cetera, and, and, and get familiar with that because uh, it, there's a multitude of stuff that is excellent and other stuff that we still need to work on. And now I'm gonna speak about some ongoing controversies uh, in green policy. Maria, we only have about 16 minutes left as well, so I just want to make you aware of the time. How many minutes do we have? We have 16 left in what we had advertised. 16? Yeah, one second. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. We're almost there. Uh, uh, okay, so in some areas, the greens remain divided, and these are areas where they have been policies that have, I guess, been not have... Um, gather enough support, they have gone to workshop and not fully decided what they're gonna say. And there's there's no there's divisions in the membership and then it makes it harder for our spokespersons to speak about things uh, like this because we don't have a coherent uh, policy. We do have them, but people agree there's too much disagreement. And um the uh I guess our the Greens don't don't win votes. So if somebody, if um, uh, Elizabeth May wants to vote one way and Mike Morris wants to go vote in a different way on some of these issues where we are divided, it's acceptable in the green world, but still important that we have the discussions and the conversations to see if we can come up with what our green policy is. One of them is animal agriculture. There's three schools of thought in the Green Party about this. One school of th thought is completely opposed to animal supporting animal agriculture in any way. Uh, there's an, there is another uh, school of thought that say, no, we should support, it's not animal agricultural problem, it's industrial animal agriculture. It's the industrial system. And then there's another school of thought that say, we have we have uh, too many animals, more than the ecosystem can sustain, and it's okay to have animal agriculture, but in an in a eco ecologically sustainable way, and that's going to result in fewer animals, but not all of them are going to be gone. And then this debate has been going on for a long time, and in the provincial party. Uh, where I also work, uh, the, the Green Party of PI, the same debate is also going on. And last last um, convention, we have a motion on this and it didn't pass because it was something like 50 to 49. It's very, it, there's a big division. The other one is supply management. The Green Party officially su supports supply management, but the thing is that because practically all of supply management it's to support or to manage the market of animal agriculture because as it's dairy and, and poultry and eggs, then the people who oppose any support to animal agriculture, they said that we should not support supply management. So it makes sense for them. So, and the other one is the food recommendations. What is green and what isn't? And there is some debate around supporting the, fully supporting the Canada Food Guide. Uh, and I think that that one is a little bit closer to 
uh, achieving some consensus. And it, it seems to me that all of these three areas have something to do on people, whether people support to include some animal foods in the diet and, the, and in, agri in the agriculture ecosystems or not. So these are some ongoing controversies in the party. Anybody knows of any other controversy that has to do with agriculture? There's many other controversies, but uh, that has to do with agriculture and food. Uh, I have a question also. Yeah. Um, what is meant by supply management? Like what is, I don't understand. That. Yeah, <laughs> it's the, if it, for dairy poultry and um, eggs, there are certain sectors that to protect the domestic uh, production, the government has a system that is called supply management, which means that these, these sectors are not, they're domestically oriented. They're not intent to export anything. And they have a combination of quotas and huge um, uh, tariff for the imports. And there's also there are tariff rate quotas when you can import some freely and then you get a huge tariff for, and this is to protect the domestic market because that prevents the market from being overflowed with product and then uh, it becomes unprofitable, which is what happens in the United States. All the small dairy farms and poultry farms that disappear because the margins are, are so small because they, they don't have supply management. And we do have supply management. And because of that, we can keep the farms in, a, I guess, in a reasonable size and people don't have to become huge. So, but because of these three areas of supply managed commodities, uh, they are animals, people who, they, 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 the, I guess the sector of the party does not want to support animal agriculture in any way because supply management is a form of subsidy, then they don't want to support supply management because subsidizing animal, anim, I mean, animal farming, you see? Uh, is, is that, is that, um, is that, that answer the question? Uh, yes, perfect, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so I'm sorry, it's, we're getting almost to the end and I want some time at the end to, to discuss. So I want to talk about emerging issues. These are areas where we not have, we may not have very specific policies, but we need them. We need to develop policies and positions. These are things that are on our radar right now and are coming. And some of them are very general and some are more specific. For example, right now, we're going to, uh, the um, countries who, that can afford it, they support agriculture with subsidies and transfers because if they don't, then they get inundated with uh, product from other countries who have subsidies and transfers and then uh, the ag agriculture would just, with your food sovereignty will just not exist. So Canada has lost that, like uh, all the um, OECD countries have. We spend $7 billion every year in agriculture supports. And uh, for a lot of these policies and subsidies, um, they we have funding envelopes federally, and uh, there's a, it's an agreement between the federal government and the provinces where uh, and they are funding envelopes that are good for five years. So the one that we have now is just about to end. It's 20, 23, 20, 20, uh, like 2018 to 2023. And right now in April this year was starting a new five year with new program with new money. It's gonna have 25% more money than the previous one. And it's called the Sustainable Agriculture, Canadian Agriculture Partnership. And in that, uh, it, and it has a series of priorities and a lot of them. Uh, they has a quite a bit on some of the things that we've been discussing here, like climate, uh, improving the environmental performance and, and climate, uh, imp reducing the climate impact of agriculture, uh, some of the things that we're talking about, carbon sequestration in farms. It has a lot of that, but the devil is in the detail how these programs are designed. And if they decided to support these big conglomerates and uh, 
co corporate control, agriculture, and, and monocultures, which, which happened before, then then uh, you know it can it can be window dressing. We say, yeah, it's, we're having so many millions of dollars for sustainable whatever, and then you go and read the detail, then it, you know where the money is going to go. So we should keep an eye on what it actually looks like once the programs are released. The other one that is a big concern and it's very scary is that there is ongoing work in the government uh, on the regulatory framework governing plant breeding. And there's a number of initiatives that I encourage you to look at. One is called seed regulatory modernization. The other one is called value creation, and plant breeding innovation. All of these things are euphemisms. They are uh, they're privatizing initiatives. They want to reduce the, the need for providing data when you are applying for, a, 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 I guess, a, a, it could be a, a, a GMO to be released. It, it, there is something that called incorporation by reference where they said new information. It doesn't have to be in the regulation. There's removing the, there is an initiative that is proposing to remove the need for risk assessment for the environment of gene edited crops because they're saying, oh, it's just a little addition. There is value creation. I don't know what they call it like that. It's horrible. It's about royalty schemes that we, farmers are gonna end up paying for publicly uh, released varieties. So all of these things, we should keep an eye. They're not, a, they're, that they haven't happened yet, but there is potential for things that we should really uh, watch out and have very strong positions as greens. And then also in our radar are the commitments and targets uh, from COP15, the Conference of the Parties on Biodiversity, the Biodiversity Framework Agreement, because there are a bunch of targets there that have to do with agriculture. And, uh, and they are what they, in the course of these negotiations, some of these proposed targets, they kind of got watered down and then it becomes harder to first to, to even measure if, 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 they, if the targets were achieved. So you don't know because, uh, so the government committed to a number of things, but then the, the Canadian government has, has um, a history of having targets and either not meeting or not knowing if they met them in this kind of environmentally, uh, uh, or uh, I guess related area like uh, emissions. And this is the same, okay? They say, for example, they're gonna reduce nutrient losses and pesticide risk by a certain percentage, but nobody knows how they're gonna measure the percentage of risk. Uh, and things like that. So we should pay attention because how is the government going to meet these targets? Uh, for example, increased biosafety measures regarding the release of GMO. The government signed on the dotted line that they're gonna do this. And at the same time, they having all these initiatives to, well, I guess, do the opposite, to um, decrease the oversight rather than increase the oversight. Uh, so these are some things I encourage you, again, the presentation is gonna be shared to uh, keep an eye on them, please get involved, please engage. And uh, it's really important that we all, like mem the membership engage in, in policy because that is responsibility of the membership. And uh, then I have talked enough and I, and this is discussion time now. What is in your mind? I have a question. What should we, yes. I have a question from Mark in the chat. Um, so G Mark says GATT, the general agreement of trade and tariff, limits the extent of the policy development. Uh, Mark's wondering, is there an evaluation of GATT policy when members are making policies? Yes. Uh, not the members, but uh, when, if you, the, I think, and this is 
part of the issue with our policy process that I guess we don't we don't have we we say that the members set policy, but then what happens is that because we don't have a good process to support this policy making, the membership then there, if there is a policy and there is no practical to apply, uh, if there's something that the I guess the um. Uh, our legislators are not, they feel that their hands are tied, are tied and they cannot uh, take that position, then the member policy sits there. So the way to avoid this is to make sure the, mem the, the policies that members are developed can withstand this kind of scrutiny. The, the general, I guess the trade, the trade measures that Canada, Canada is a signatory of all the WTO agreements, right? If you're talking about GATT, uh, and then I guess that was replaced by the WTO agreements and there's a bunch of them. And I guess there's technical trade, sanitary, sanitary measure, tariff, whatever, this all, it's tariff is only one part of the WTO agreement. There's also many non-tariff things. There's intellectual properties. There's everything. This is a, a science in itself, trying to figure out all the trade, all the trade agreements and how they impact the domestic policy in countries. It's a huge area. We could speak hours about that. Um, and it's important because sometimes people are told, oh no, you can't do that because the trade agreement or whatever, and it's not true. It's, it's, an, easy, it's an easy way out of not doing it. Because when you look at the detail, they, there are ways that you can, and I don't know if I'm explaining myself well. It's very important to understand trade agreements because they do have constraints, but it's also, but it, but sometimes uh, you can overcome those constraints with po in policy. If it, if it, you have enough support to just get over the, the hurdles and the barriers. Mark says, excellent answer. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, that was nice. Uh, anybody, I, I want more discussion. I'm hungry for discussion. Say something. Can you hear me if I speak? Yes. Well, how about that? Um, I don't really have anything on my mind, but you asked for, it's been, it's been very, very interesting. I'm glad I did uh, tune in today. Um, and, and as Sarah had recently put in the chat, a suggestion of this last little segment that you've focused on uh, could, could be a full, uh, a full other uh, event session and discussion and to uh, more widely uh, let members know that su such an opportunity exists. That being said, I think it's wise to keep it to members only. I understand that you've uh, invited others and perspectives and I don't know maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure why I feel that way it's just a, a, an impulse in in the sense of uh, of non non-members being here and uh, I think even Sarah mentioned some comment about well maybe we shouldn't say that when when we're not secluded uh, just amongst ourselves and in terms of any leaks but um I, I think that's an inflation of uh, our importance that anybody would be spying here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you. You see, I, I, members versus non-members. Of course, the members are the ones who are supposed to build the policy. So it's kind of important for members. But for non-members, it may be important too, because they may like our policies and then yeah. we become members. Good point. May I speak? May I speak? Y yes, please. Sure, it's Sarah Gabrielle Barron here coming to you from Odawa, Anishinaabek, unceded territory. 
um, also known as Ottawa. And um, I just want to clarify. So our member made policy book um, that was shared as a PDF is totally cool. Um, and it is accessible if you sign in as a member and, um, on the party website. And if you sign into that link that I've shared a couple times, that was the leadership race, that was the website that was had a couple transformations and it's interactive. And you again, you can only get into it as a member. And, um, and then it's a really cool place if you go over to the far right to work together on um, seeing our 2020 policies um, that finally got approved in 2021 and 2022. And, um, and, and it's a cool interactive place to, um, to, to, to maybe generate new policies. So, so I'm gonna dig into that website and maybe see some of you there. Um, and, and just to say, you can reach out to me if you're interested in a small project to get our 2020 policies, the newest ones into the actual PDF that's available on the GPC website. There's not enough staff to do that job right now. Um, it's a small job and it's kind of clerical. Um, so I'm just sgb at greenparty.ca. And the only reason why our member made policy book um, really shouldn't be shared with the public is because some of it is really old and really out of date. And um, it has been used um, by other parties in the past during election to kind of say, oh, you know, what a joke. Um, but, you know, if you've got a policy from 1988, um, it's just that, you know, it's a living document and it, and it shows where we have been and where we are right now and where we are going. So um, that's why we just need to keep it within the members because as Greens, we understand what that document is, but outsiders um, don't necessarily. All done. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, group, for organizing. What a great, uh, what a great, what a great uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm just going to make um, somebody's putting me on the spot because somebody's asking about trade agreements and whether the party supports them or not. And the party supports some, some uh, agree some things, some trade tariff reductions and things like that and some and not others right and they're asking me how how would i personally uh how would i personally support or not support trade agreements well the devil is in the detail what does the trade agreement say canada has a huge number of trade agreements because we've been promoting this export oriented thing for years and years and they're they're negotiated very intensely and sometimes we sacrifice certain things to gain others and I could also uh, one of the things that I could speak hours about is about the things we sacrifice to achieve other trade advantages and uh, so there is not an easy answer yes or no I think the problem with trade agreements is what they say. We support, and Sarah said that we support fair trade, not free trade, and that's true. That's our policy. But trade agreements are not all free. They have, they have um, protections that people negotiate for, and and that and those protections. Are important and how can we today get out of all the trade agreements we have? The answer is no, because if we did, and then okay, let's say we could have, let's say we get out of all the trade agreements we have, and then we raise huge tariffs. It would be very difficult because then we would also be taken to all kinds of tribunals of, because of treaties we have signed. And uh, it, it's, it's a nice idea, but from a practical point of view, I don't think it's feasible in the short term. What is feasible is to work to strengthen the protections in trade agreements and not let corporate capture, take over everything, you see? Uh, it's, uh, but 
uh, you are thanking me and I, I, I am not even answering the question because I think to answer the question, we need another hour, which we don't have. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we have a question from Liz in the chat that I just want to go back to. So Liz was wondering how to get farmers on board. Um, Liz asked, do you know if we have tax policies to reward or incentivize farmers to keep wildlands and shelter belts? If not, we need that instead of tax breaks and write-offs to encourage land clearing in 2023. We have policies uh, supporting uh, uh, shelter belts, and um, but we but I do not know if we have money attached to them. We do have it is it is our policy. It's just I I just don't know if we specifically said we should be paying so much for doing it. I don't think we are. Uh, but it is our policy to support uh, those things. And it is support, it, we do have some tax policy in our policies, but it's limited. Because one, one area of our policy process has been that uh, people like members have been discouraged of putting percentages and uh, I guess quantitative things in policies. We do have a policy to incentivize biodiversity in farms. Uh, somebody put on the chat. Uh, yes, and we do have that one. If that one is new and we have other biodiversity policies in previous policy that are related. Yeah, and uh, so so the po the po the new one is the one with incentives that are payments, and that's only one type of incentive uh, for that because there's also regulation that could uh, promote biodiversity in farms. I think the new one is the one that has payments. That's the one, Sarah. Sarah, um, I think Sarah put the number there. And that's uh, that policy is on payments, if I re remember correctly, isn't it, sir? No, but it is um, yeah, okay. I encourage everybody to just go and use the search function where you do control F, find something in the document when you're looking for something and more likely than not, you will find it. <laughs> Hi, uh, my video. I decided to turn on my video to say bye to everybody and thank everybody for being here. And uh, I'm so glad that you came and stayed so long. We still have 15 people. I guess some probably left, but thank you so much for saying and for coming. Yeah, thank and, you. Oh, did you have something else you wanted to add? Sorry. No, it's your turn. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you very much for participating and speaking. Um, I'm glad that we organized this event and I, I appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise. Um, a couple other quick notes is that we have a by-election also coming up in Winnipeg South Center. Um, so that was part of why I wanted to host this as well, just to like get some activity going in our area. Um, so of course, donations are welcome to help support that campaign. And then the last thing I just would ask if you have a moment to fill out the evaluation form, um, I'll share the link again. And that will help us to um, improve for the future. I am not the candidate, Shell. Um, we have one person whose nomination has been approved, and that is the same candidate who ran last time. Uh, his name is Doug Hemmerling. Um, and nominations will be closing in about a week. Uh, so after that, we will know if Doug is the only candidate or if anyone else steps forward between now and then, we will have to hold a nomination meeting to elect the candidate. Um, yeah, good. best best of everything, uh, and I think the by-election is 
is uh, is important. It's a, it's a right and that it, there could be some some green support on that here in PI. We're coming is a federal uh, sorry a general provincial election is coming up and I have had so many nomination <laughs> meetings that I've been to and yesterday I was in one of them really late and I was worried about falling asleep <laughs> in this seminar but it didn't happen because luckily the audience was was um, uh, very active which is always good. Yeah, and like part of the desire to organize this event was um, there's not a lot of green activity in Manitoba. Um, and I think the only way to do that is to start creating activity in Manitoba. Um, you are right. I saw, and you are absolutely right. You're just mm -hmm, you're preaching so. to the to the choir here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what I will ask everybody who came to this meeting to do is think about policy and think if there's something that you would like to work on. Because I imagine that if people came to this, it's because they're interested and we need more people interested in policy in the party. Uh, and also that this idea that there are some areas that are pretty solid in the sense that they're definitely things that we support. Um, it's important that people get comfortable about the things we stand for when campaigning, when knocking at the door with candidates, right? And sometimes, sometimes that's I, I feel that it's not it's not given we don't give it enough emphasis to that because we're almost afraid of ruffling feathers or something. Um, what else? What else can I say? Uh, the EDA, thanks so much for doing this from an EDA perspective, because you're right, Kyle. The way to get people doing something is to do something. <laughs> and the, our EDAs need all the help they can get. Yeah. Um, this is, yes. And, and because this is a serious, don't forget to tell us what you would like to see that we could change for the next time. Yeah. And a quick comment too on like why, like we're not gonna grow our membership by like not talking to people who aren't members. <laughs> so it was really important to me to, especially Manitoba, to extend the invitation to members and non-members because that's like, how else are people gonna learn about who we are and what the party does and what we stand for, right? So, and I, I think, I wasn't even aware until like a year ago that you could become a member of a political party. So I think um, for many people, um, that's even a new concept. So I think it's really important that we have events like this that are open to everyone, because um, that's the only way people are gonna learn about us and for us to learn about each other. There is a question from Shell. Is the nominee here? Um. I did not see him today, no. Sorry, Shell. I think he was planning to make it, but I guess something came up. I know Elizabeth and May was just in town. Uh, they, I think she flew out today. Um, so there was some events going on this past week. So they might've been a little, uh... <laughs> Shell. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Maria, do you have anything else to say before I shut off the recording and we close the webinar? Thank you, everyone. Uh, no, I, I'm good. Any any last words? Any last thoughts? And if not, I wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>